as the result of us unable to meet together as God's family at Prairie Plains. I've chosen to do a Bible study over the next few weeks on 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As you know, chapter 15 is known as the resurrection chapter. It deals with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it also deals with our resurrection. When you study the book of Acts and study the different sermons that were proclaimed to the different uh, groups of people, the different lessons that were taught, one thing stands out. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, he did die. Yes, he was buried. But he didn't stay in the grave. He was resurrected on the third day. And that was a major emphasis as you study those particular sermons. For example, in Acts chapter 2, verse 31 and 32, the resurrection was preached to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 3, verses 11 through 16, the resurrection of Jesus was preached to the people at Solomon's porch. The resurrection of Christ was the focal point when Paul preached to the Jews and to the Gentiles when he traveled from one city to the next. He made it very clear the reason that he was on trial was the result of proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He preached the resurrection to the governor, Felix, in Acts chapter 24, verse 21. He preached the resurrection to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 8. Has our preaching today changed? Are we good at just telling people how sinful they are without giving them the hope of eternal life that we have in Jesus Christ? Yes, we need to tell people that based upon our flesh, our own words, we can never be right in the sight of God. We need to understand, as Paul wrote in the first three chapters of the book of Romans, how sinful we really are. It's our iniquities that have separated us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He summarizes in verse 9 of Romans chapter 3 that both Jew and Gentile alike are all under sin. They're under the bondage of sin. They're all sinners. Verse 10, he states, there's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, he says, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so this is why the resurrection is so important. For you see, in 1 Corinthians 15, he stresses the point that if there is no resurrection of Jesus, everything else in life is meaningless. In verse 17 of chapter 15, it states that if Christ be not raised, if he not be resurrected from the grave, he says, our faith is in vain, and we are still in our sins. In verse 19, two verses later, he says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. In our lesson for tonight, I want to introduce it by looking at verse 12 of chapter 15. For you see, in this particular verse, Paul writes, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? What I want us to notice from this particular verse is that not all of them were rejecting the resurrection from the dead. It was some of them that were rejecting that proposition. 
they were did not denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as you see in verses 12 through 19. They were denying their own resurrection. And Paul argues, he says, if you were right, then Christ couldn't have risen. Because what his resurrection signifies is that we are going to be resurrected also. If they'd been denying Christ's resurrection, they would have replied back to Paul, of course, that's exactly what we have been affirming. Why did they have such a hard time with this doctrine? Well, it goes back to the definition of the word resurrection. Anastasis. Anastasis. It's derived from the verb isthma. Isthma means to stand again or to cause to stand. Plus the preposition ana, which means up and again. You put them together. It is a state of standing. A state of standing again. So resurrection is that this body that's planted in the earth, this body that has died and has been buried, is going to stand again. When did it stand the first time? When it was alive. Paul says the body will be resurrected. He says that it will stand again. For those who take the position that the body that was that is buried in the ground will not be resurrected, I ask this question. How can the body stand again if it's not stood before? It stood when it was alive, and it shall stand again. That is why Martha stated in John chapter 11, verse 24, I know that her brother Lazarus, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. In John chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus has just told her, Thy brother shall rise again. In John chapter 5, verse 28 and verse 29, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Notice, the ones that are in the grave, the body that is in the grave, the body that is dying, he says, shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good, notice, they shall come forth. They shall be resurrected. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So in death, the body, not the soul, is compared to be sleeping. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 15. And what I want you to picture here is that he is stating and comparing the body that when it dies, it is in a state of sleep. For when someone goes to sleep, they will be awakened again. The body is asleep, not the soul, not the spirit. Notice verse 13 of First Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, concerning those that have already died, concerning those that have been buried, that you sorrow not, you don't grieve as others grieve who have no hope. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So he compares the body when it dies being a state of sleep The grave being the bed where it sleeps, and it will hear the voice and will come forth in the resurrection at the last day. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Who in the world would have ever suggested at this particular time that there would be no resurrection from the dead, a bodily resurrection? Well, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. Acts chapter 23, verse 8. It says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So you have the Pharisees who believe in angels, who believes in a spirit, who believes in a bodily resurrection, whereas the Sadducees did not. In Acts chapter 17, verse 32, it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So when Paul and the others started proclaiming the resurrection of Christ or our resurrection, people became upset and others wished to hear more concerning the resurrection. Maybe some of these people had become Christians, accepting the resurrection of Christ and denying their own bodily resurrection. Those of Greek backgrounds could have been influenced by many of their different philosophers they had at that particular time who denied a resurrection of man. Oh, they believed the soul continues to live after death, but the body does not continue to exist. Period. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 32, I ask this question, if there is no life after death, there is no resurrected body after death. Notice the conclusion that we come up with. Paul stated, If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What good has it been for me to have fought this way and struggled, risking my life if there is no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection from the dead, why don't we just go out here and have a party, have a good time? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that's the end. When you have people from all kind of backgrounds started starting to follow Jesus and be obeying the gospel of Christ. They bring with them all of the preconceived ideas that they have learned on their own, that others have taught them. Sometimes they're not found in the Bible. And they have to continually be taught to correct these misunderstandings. For example, when Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, to go into all the world and to teach all nations, make disciples of all nations. How do you do that, Jesus? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you don't baptize them until they are ready to be baptized, that they understand that they're sinners that Jesus Christ died for their sins, that He is the Son of God, and that He was ascended into heaven, interceding on our behalf today, being our mediator today. The resurrection is so relevant today as it was during the days of Paul. Although we do not have the same labels on people, we still have many who do not believe that a life after death is possible. Death ends it all, they believe. So we just ought to live it up here. Many believe that, believe that this body will not be raised from the grave. Changed? Yes. But it will be this body that will be resurrected. Recognizable? without a doubt. Let me remind you that the existence of the New Testament church affirms the resurrection. What about the institution of the Lord's Supper by Jesus Christ? It affirms the resurrection. For you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as he 
is, is dealing with the Lord's Supper and the attitude in particular the Lord's Supper in the, in the second part of the chapter. In verse 26, Paul writes, For as often as you eat this bread, and as often as you drink this cup, what do I show Paul? I show, we show the Lord's death till he comes. We are affirming that Jesus Christ died and he's coming back. How can he come back if he's died and, and not been resurrected? He's, it's, we show his death, we show his return. Baptism affirms the resurrection also. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 5, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. That like as in, in verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. First Peter chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 states that baptism is connected with the resurrection. In verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereinto even baptism doth also now say thus, not the putting away the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're baptized, and we can have a good conscience before God. Our sins are cleansed, not the filth of the flesh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us. We've been born again into a living hope, a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we know that that new birth occurs when we are born again of the water and the Spirit. John 3, verses 3 through 5. Because of God's great grace, we can be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And baptism saves us through the resurrection of Jesus. We're baptized into his death. We're buried with him in water in baptism. And we are raised to walk in a new Life. Raised as a new creature, as Paul writes in St. Corinthians 5, a new creation with a new master, a new life. Today's lesson, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The question that Paul raises, are the dead raised? And this is what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. And in answering that particular question, Paul gives three proofs. Their salvation, in verse 1 and 2, proves that there is a resurrection of the dead. In verses 3 through 4, the Old Testament scriptures prove that there is a resurrection from the dead. And then in verses 5 through 11, Paul gives another proof that there is a resurrection from the dead, and that is that Christ was seen by many witnesses after his resurrection, before he ascended unto the Father. And next week we'll pick up with verse 1, and I hope that you've enjoyed this introduction to this particular chapter. I miss my church family. I miss my brothers and sisters in Christ. And hopefully what this nation is going through will not last much longer. It is my prayer that no one else will die and that a healing will take place in America, not only physically, but spiritually. Thank you. 
Kurt Cheney and 